I think this is a good time to start. Um, so good morning, everybody, um, or depending on where you are in the world, good afternoon or good evening. Welcome to the CSDMS uh, full webinar series. Um, I'm very excited today because we have two speakers um, who are runners up for the CSDMS Student Modeler Award. Um, Derek uh, Neuhardt and Dang Hang Si. Uh, Derek is from uh, ETA Zurich uh, in Switzerland and Dang Hang is from uh, Boston University here in the US. Um, the actual award went to Kyle Wright uh, from the University of Texas and he presented his work on uh, uh, grains to plastic sorting of uh, transported materials uh, in uh, deltaic areas. Um, he presented that during the CSDMS meeting. Uh, when was that? In May, I think. Uh, it's a little bit of a blur, <laughs> quite busy here. Um, so, but before um, we're going to start uh, with uh, presentations, I would like to introduce uh, or give the floor to Dr. Sam uh, Harrison. Sam is uh, an environmental modeler at the UK Center of Ecology and Hydrology. And Sam spent the summer here uh, at CSTMS in Boulder. And uh, he actually suggested to have a, a Euro CSTMS webinar series. So uh, Sam, can you tell a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, so this was my my secondment over in CU Boulder was as a part of a project where the, the bigger effort really is to bring together communities that do um, integrated environmental modeling, uh, specifically communities that write software to help with, with integrated environmental modeling, um, which obviously includes CSDMS and all the amazing work that you guys do, um, plus some software communities, some work that we do at our institute over in the uh, over in Europe, over in the UK. Um, part of this, as I say, is very much building a community of practice, and and we saw a bit of a a, a gap here or an opportunity here rather to um, broaden broaden the geographical reach potentially of the CSDMS webinars, the CSDMS communities um, over to Europe. Um, so with that in mind, we we decided this time around to run a couple of the the four webinars as as Eurosystems webinars. Um, they're obviously not just for European people; anyone from around the world can join them. But we've we've kind of focused them a little bit in terms of where the speakers come from, and made the times a little bit friendlier for the um, for European people. Um, so we've got two two webinars happening. The first. That, are, that have this Euro system, systems uh, theme. The first one's on the 5th of October. So that's actually the next webinar in the series. Um, that will be Gordon Blair from the UKCH, my institute, um, talking to us about digital twins of the natural environment. Um, and then the final webinar of the series on December the 6th uh, will be Julien Jove from uh, the University of Lausanne um, talking to us about glacial evolution modeling. And you're all very welcome. Thank you, Sam. That's great. And I just put uh, in the chat the link also to the webinars that Sam just mentioned. So you can register for them if you want. Um, so that's there for you. All right. Um, in no particular order, um, I think, uh, Derek, you're first listed on the, on the webinar in the announcement. So I'm going to give the floor, floor first to you. Um, so Derek will present today on how numerical models provide insight in how surface processes influence tectonics uh, on divergent and strike slip uh, boundaries. So with that, the floor is yours. Okay, let's see. Perfect. I can see your screen. Looks good. Okay, thank you for yep. the introduction. Um, hi, everyone. So today I'm going to be talking about the evolution of divergent and strike slip boundaries in response to surface processes, though for the most part, this is going to focus on rift systems. So to start, I want to go over a little bit how, or I guess, how rifts work in the different types we see. And there's three main types of rifts that we see in nature. First, if you have deformation that's localized in a very narrow region, 
you'll get a narrow rift. And then whether this deformation is symmetric along the rift, central rift axis, as you see in this one, you can have a narrow symmetric rift, or if it's asymmetric, you get an asymmetric rift. And then in some cases though, deformation isn't as localized as this, and you actually get faulting occurring over hundreds of kilometers. And in this case, you'll get a wide rift. And so how these rifts kind of work is you have uh, extension being applied to an extensional force that is thinning the lithosphere. And so as this happens, you begin to thin the lithosphere in some region. And so this occurs both at the top and beneath the lithosphere. And at the top, we have brittle deformation. So we have extensional faulting that then creates a depression called Rift Valley that we can see here, which is a good place to then deposit sediment. We also, under the, or we also thin the lithosphere underneath where we have upwelling asthenosphere that creates this uh, region called the necking zone. And because we have warm material upwelling into this region, this also works to fur further localize the deformation. So we continue to really focus our deformation into this small region. And so as we continue to pull, we continue to thin this lithosphere until eventually we completely break the lithosphere and we start exhuming mantle material. This then forms an oceanic crust and we get into uh, seafloor spreading. <laughs> and so what I wanna point out in this one is even when we're, we have the seafloor spreading, we can see that we still have some of these faults in this deformation that occurred that is kind of uh, recorded in these passive margins. So this is kind of the history of the rifting event that they will take seismic data to look more into. And so people that have looked into this have found that there's actually some trends in how a rift system thins the crust towards seafloor spreading. And so if they look at this thinning, they can actually divide it into a few different domains that they see. First, when you don't have much thinning of the crust, but you still have some faulting, this would be known as the proximal domain. Eventually you begin to start to drastically thin the crust. And this will be when you're into this necking domain. And eventually you get to hyperextended, very thin crust and the kind of rate changes a bit. And this would be a hyperextended domain. Uh, and then after this, in some cases, you'll exhume the mantle lithosphere that's underneath and then eventually into seafloor spreading. And so it's important to see this because we see examples of uh, relict rifts and also active rifts throughout the world. So an example of one of these that is active is the East African Rift System down here, where we have two active rift segments that are splitting apart the African continent. And so this is in uh, kind of those earlier stages I was talking about where we're still breaking apart the lithosphere. And if this goes on long enough, can everyone see my mouse? Just a... Yes, yes, we can see your mouse. Okay, it keeps disappearing on me, I was confused. <laughs> But so if this goes on long enough, you eventually get to your uh, mid-ocean ridges like the Atlantic Ocean. And then in these zones, if we then go to near the coastlines, we can find these passive margins. So for example, the Newfoundland and the Barian are conjugate margins that would record the history of this rifting event. And so there's been a lot of previous work that has looked into how these rifting works in models, whether this is looking at 2D models that are trying to see what exactly creates asymmetric rifts, or maybe how rifts can deactivate and reactivate in different areas, or even large scale uh, 3D models that are trying to look at how rift arms interact like in the East African rift system. But a one thing that is important to consider is how we look at the surface in these models. So there's a few different ways we can do this. One of the most simple ones is to use a free slip surface. So this is where the material can flow along the surface, but you can't actually deform the surface with the stresses that are there. So a lot of models actually use a free surface, which you can see on the left here, which then allows the surface to use these stresses and deform through time. But one thing you might notice here is that we get these unrealistically high topographies at the surface and also unrealistically low valleys that form. This is because there's nothing that can work to deform the surface through time. And so additionally, because a lot of this deformation happens near the surface, these changes to loading based off this topography can affect how the uh, deformation evolves. So then if we were to include some surface processes, we'll no longer have this issue and we'll actually redistribute our surface through time. And this can then affect the brittle deformation that's happening near the surface. And so there has been some work in RIFS also that has looked at adding this uh, surface processes to these models. And this is kind of done in two different ways. One that you can see here in the top is where they use just a 1D diffusion equation which is kind of short range transport of the sediment. And they put this on here to see how these basins and everything affect this deformation. 
And the second way that's becoming more common now is to couple these tectonic or geodynamic codes with dedicated landscape evolution codes. And so here's an example of this down here where we have uh, Sepal coupled with Fastscape. And this has the added benefit of having more complex uh, surface process laws, such as the stream power law. But one thing a lot of these models have found looking into this is that surface processes generally increase the localization on a fault, and this has the effect of prolonging the fault lifespan. And one thing I want to mention is a lot of these previous studies, they take qual kind of a qualitative look at the model evolution. So there hasn't been much quantifying how faults change based off of these surface processes. So during this talk, the main questions I want to go over are how does surface process affect an evolving rift and its fault network in 2D? And this is something where we want to take a quantitative look at the fault network. The second question is, can sediment loading drive flexural substance along a strikes the fault? And the third, which will be rather a short uh, section, is just what effect may surface processes have on large scale 3D models? And the method for doing this is going to be using a method that I worked on during my PhD, which was a two-way coupling between the open source codes aspect and fastscape. So aspect is a geodynamic code that has been used for subduction models, plume models, and rift models. And um, one of the, the selling points of aspect is that it has this adaptively refining mesh. So you can have the mesh that changes over time and keeps refining the areas that you're actually interested in. And then the way that aspect handles deformation of material within the model is through two different ways, generally the brittle deformation. And so this is where you'll have your faults. And this is something through like the buyer leaf law or the drucker prego law, where near the surface, when you're cold and brittle, generally you'll focus deformation to very thin shear zones that could represent faults. As you get deeper into the system, you have higher pressures, you have higher temperatures, so you can no longer have these faults forming. And in this case, you begin to have rock that flows more like a fluid into the ductile deformation regime. And here we use a harmonic average of two different laws, the Newtonian diffusion, uh, Newtonian diffusion or a strain rate dependent dislocation law. And so we took this model and we coupled it to the landscape evolution code Fastscape, which is available in quite a few different languages. For our purposes, we use the Fortran version. And so this is just something that applies a set of routines to deform the surface and erode and deposit sediment. And then this is just a quick example video of this having, I believe, uplift in the stream power law applied to it. And so Fastscape can deform the surface in quite a few different ways. And this depends on whether you're above or below sea level. And so if you're above sea level, the change in topography over time is related to the uplift rate and the advection term. And so these are two things where Aspect will send these velocities to Fastscape and then Fastscape will use them to change the surface. And in addition to this, we, we apply the stream power law, which is how rivers are incised into the system, as you can kind of see over here where we have these river systems forming. And this is based off of some erodibility coefficient KF and then the drainage area and the slope. After this, there's a sediment deposition term, which is just to say that this these rivers hold some amount of sediment and out of the sediment, some part of it can be deposited back onto land, which again, you can kind of see in this image with some deposition occurring down here. And then lastly, it has the hill slope diffusion uh, term, which is just the diffusion, the short range transport of sediment. Below sea level, it works similarly, but there's a little bit of difference. The main, uh, I guess the similarities is that again, we have the uplift term, the advection term, so we move our surface. And then we have a diffusion term as well, but we'll use a different coefficient in this case. And the major difference is that there's this continental sediment flux term. And so what this says is that all the sediment that was eroded from the stream power law that did not get deposited based off the second term will end up in our oceans, pushing a lot of sediment into there. And then lastly, for these models, we add some constant background ocean, oceanic sedimentation rate. So the first question I wanted to talk about is how do surface processes affect an evolving rift in its fault network? And so for this, we set up a uh, 2D aspect model that's tied to a 2D fast state model. And the way this works for these 2D models is that the velocities from aspect surface will be sent to every node along Y. And then um, after this, you'll run fast scape, you'll find the difference between the new surface, the old surface, and then you'll average this again back along Y down to one single point and send this back to aspect surface so it can deform. Uh, and so for Fastscape, we have Fastscape on top with all the laws I just talked about. And then we have our aspect model where we have 
a lithosphere that's 120 kilometers thick and then 35 kilometers of crust. And then we pull this at a maximum of 10 millimeters per year to see uh, how it deforms. And so what we're really interested in is before I talked about, we had these three different rift types. So we wanted to know how this changes with wide rifts, asymmetric rifts and symmetric rifts. And then also we wanna know how surface processes affect it. So we either have no surface processes at all, or we change our KF value, the erodibility of our stream power law uh, to simulate very low erosion of very, very high erosion. And so here um, is a video of the symmetric model evolution. And uh, this is kind of like a qualitative look at how you would watch these models to see how they would evolve. So we have the top portion of aspect and then our fastscape surface above. And so what you notice is we immediately form very large faults in our initial rift valley. And then over time, we can begin to perform progressively smaller faults toward continental breakup. And then also when we look at here, we can see that this would be our passive margin over here that's recording the history of these older faults. And so as I mentioned previously, we wanted to have a way to kind of quantitatively see how these faults are changing through time. And to this end, we use the fat box of fault analysis toolbox that was written by Tilo Rona. And so what this does is first we take our plastic strain field. And so this is where we've accumulated brittle deformation. So it tells us where we have an active fault or where we at least had an active fault at some point. And so we take this and we threshold it down to get these shear bands. And then we discretize these down to individual line segments. Then based off this, the toolbox will apply a few routines that will separate these uh, line segments into distinct faults based off of uh, splitting and things like this. And then it'll apply a label onto each of these. And then we can track this label and the fault through time for every time step. And then on this fault label also, we can keep track of any property we're really interested in seeing, such as the slip rate, the displacement, or the uh, dip angle, or anything like that. And so here's the exact same model. But this time, we're going to show the fault network through the uh, through what the, the, the toolbox tracks. And in this, it'll show inactive faults in black, and then red and blue will be active faults. So again, first we see we have many faults that quickly localize onto a few large faults. And then at first these all stay active until eventually we become so weak in the center that we shift deformation inward and uh, deactivate our outer faults until eventually during seafloor spreading, we just get a few uh, faults that are active at time that are also quickly replaced. And so we wanted to see how this actually changes through time when we look at these fault parameters. So for this, we're going to look at just the cumulative active fault parameters, specifically the displacement, the length, and the number of faults that are active in the system. And what we find is that there's actually about four or five distinct phases that a rift system goes through as it evolves. First is the distributed deformation phase. This is the early phase we saw in the video where there's tons of active faults that are competing with each other. But eventually these localize on just to, uh, onto a few major faults, which is the end of this first phase. After this, we saw that we had all these faults active, but we're continually placing new faults into the system. And this would be our fault system growth phase. But again, as we saw in the video, eventually we get so weak in the center that these outer faults start to turn off and we focus deformation inward. And this would be the start of this fault system decline. From this point on, we begin to continually replace these faults with smaller and smaller faults until eventually we enter seafloor spreading or continental breakup, where we just have a few active faults that are replaced at a time that we can see over here. And so the next thing we want to know is, well, this is how this model evolves, but how does this change if we change the amount of surface process that we have or the erodibility from our stream power law? And so with this, we go from having absolutely no surface processes up to using a very high surface processes where we're basically eroding any topography that can form. And what we generally see is that like the previous studies, uh, surface processes works to enhance fault localization, which leads to longer lived faults. And what this means for the models is first that because you have these faults lasting longer, there's less need to create new faults. So you end up having less complex fault networks with more surface processes. The second is that it actually delays continental breakup. So we can see with no surface processes, reach continental breakup around 11 million years, which then goes to 13 to 14, up to even 18 million years when we have very high surface processes. And so the other thing is, again, we uh, applied this to all three different rift, rift types. And what we found is that generally, regardless of the rift type, we see the same four or five distinct phases. 
The only major differences between this is in the wide rift where we have deformation spread over a much wider region. Our fault system growth with all the faults active lasts much longer. And then for asymmetric, we actually have a fourth phase between the fault system decline into the continental breakup. And this would be a rift migration phase. We're really building the asymmetry into the system. But we also found that regardless of these three rift types, surface processes had the same effect where you ended up with less complex fault networks and a delay in breakup with more surface processes. And so the final thing I wanted to talk about for this part of the talk is that we mentioned how there's these three, uh, or we mentioned how there's the, um, what was I saying? the rifted domains that they see in seismic data. And we want to know how these phases compare to these rifted domains. And we found that generally they compare quite well. There's phase one distributed definitely similar proximal into the fault system growth. That's like the necking and the fault system decline. That's like hyperextended into the oceanic. The only major difference we saw was in asymmetric margins, where when we look at in the direction of rift migration, uh, we kind of can't tell where we go from phases two to four. And a reason for this that you can't really see here, but there's a nice video of it um, that I don't think there'll be time to show, unfortunately. But uh, as the rift is migrating, you actually begin to break up all the passive margin you have here, and it gets translated to the other side. So essentially, we're eating up all this history that we could have taken a look at while this rift is migrating. And so we didn't compare this to any real world seismic data, but there is a paper border at all that is maybe released now that is trying to compare this to the Norwegian margin. And so the question for the beginning, this was how does surface process affect an evolving rift and its fault network? And the main conclusions with that, it delays continental breakup, reduces fault network complexity, and this is because it works to prolong fault activity. Uh, so next I wanna talk about a specific region, which is the Andaman Sea off coast Thailand. And so this is a region that initially was an extension. So there was rift in that curtainous region, but then it shifted into a strike slip regime. And so what we're interested in is this South Sagayan fault down here. So this is a strike slip fault that th formed in this thin lithosphere from this older rift zone. And specifically along this fault, there's a basin called the East Andaman Basin, which is a laterally extensive basin that exists on both sides of the fault. And what's interesting about this basin is that when you think of a strike slip basin, you think of a pull apart basin, which has two offset segments that because of the orientation create extension between the segments that forms a kind of narrow thin basin. But in this region, there's actually no, uh, no offset segments, so there's no really way to form a pull apart basin. And in addition to this, the basin is kind of interesting that on one side of the fault, it's very thin and uniform, and on the other side, it's thick next to the fault, but then thin strike perpendicularly. And so if we look at the region during the time the fault was active, there was something called the Murugori Ridge that was subaerial. And so the idea is that maybe there was a lot of sedimentation applied to just this one, um, one side of the fault. And so the question we had from this was, well, if we have a large sediment load that's being put onto this weak strike slip fault, can we drive flexural substance along strike slip fault? And so for this, we set up a very thin 3D uh, aspect model where we have thin with a sphere that's 40 kilometers thick with very thin crest of eight kilometers. We then move one side while fixing the other so we can self-consistently form a strike slip fault in the center. And then the two sides are periodic, which is to say, even though this is a thin model, it kind of works like you have an infinitely long strike slip model because material that goes out one side will come in the other side. And then on top of this, because the whole area was underwater while it was active, we only have marine diffusion going on, but we add sediment to the system through a constant uniform sediment rain. And also we assume that we have some off-source sediment source like the Murgar Ridge and through diffusion push sediment into the system from one side. And so here's just a quick video of the reference model. So you can see we quickly localize a strike slip fault in the center. And at the same time, we're pushing a lot of sediment in through the side. And what you notice is that at the sediments being pushed in, well, actually not too much of it is making it to the other side of this fault. This is because this fault is working as a weak zone where once the sediment gets up here, the loading actually deflects uh, the crust and lithosphere down. So we end up with this thick basin here and thinner on the other side. And so one of the important questions for this too is that we have this thin lithosphere in the region, but how does this work if we would have thicker lithosphere? So we took our lithosphere thickness and we varied it from 30 to 60 kilometers. 
Uh, and what we found is that with, when you have this thin lithosphere like 30 kilometers, you get a very asymmetric basin that's much thicker on the side of the fault that has this, the high sedimentation up to about five kilometers. And if you thicken this up to 60 kilometers, you can already see that there's a much, much smaller basin forming with a maximum depth of about a kilometer. And you can also see this dashed line would be our initial surface, uh, yeah, initial surface. So we're actually just accumulating a lot of sediment on top without actually deflecting the lithosphere. And then, so just for a brief comparison between the basins, uh, here is the interpretation of the East Andaman Basin from the seismics, where we see the defining features are on one side of the fault, we have a thin uniform basin. On the other, we have a basin that's thickest near the fault and thins uh, towards the sediment source. In our reference model basin, we see something very similar. We have much thicker shear zone, of course, from our fault, but then we have a relatively uniform basin on one side, and on the other side, we have a basin that's thickest next to the fault and then thins towards where we were pushing sediment in. And so the question for this section was, can sediment loading drive flexural substance along the stripes of the fault? And what we found is that yes, if you have enough sediment, you can actually create a flexural strikes of the basin. However, you need to have a pretty thin lithosphere for this to happen. If the lithosphere is too thick, you just can't deflect the lift, deflect it at all. And this is because the fault acts to, it works as a weak zone. It decouples the two sides of the lithosphere and allows uh, accommodation space to be created. And so the last pretty short segment I wanna go over is, well, what effect does this have? We put it onto large scale 3D models. And so this is just an example of a model in aspect and the same fastscape surface on top of it. And so to start with this, uh, this is an older study I did. And so this was just checking how offset rifts connect. And we found that based off of their X offset and the crustal strength, they either connect through an oblique connection, or if you get farther apart, a transform connection, or even farther, they begin to overlap and you rotate the central microplate. And so when we were first testing this coupling, we just took one of these models and put it on top, just kind of to see what it worked. And specifically, we took this transform connection model. And so here's just a brief video of the fastscape surface during this evolution. So you can see we form our rift valleys and our rift flanks that have a lot of sediment being pushed onto them or off of them, especially into that basin. And so what we'd expect from the uh, free surface model is that these two sides would propagate forward and then they would connect through a transform fault here. But what we actually ended up seeing in this case is that we're not actually seeing this transform fault forming. We're actually seeing rotation, which is more into our microplate regime, which is what we'd expect if we actually had a larger X offset than what we have here. And just to really showcase this, so this is two of the exact same model, one run with the free surface that formed this transform fault as we expected. And just by adding these surface processes, we actually changed this regime into this microplate that we didn't expect from these X offsets based off the free surface model. And so I wanna note that this is more, this was just a test, so it wasn't really the most realistic setup. But I think this just illustrates that uh, surface processes definitely can have an effect on these 3D models and something to look into in the future. So the major questions for this talk were how does surface process affect an evolving rift and its fault network? Can sediment loading drive flexural substance along the strikes of fault? And what effect may surface processes have on large scale 3D models? And the final conclusions are that when you have surface processes on a RIF system, it works to delay breakup and it also reduces the fault network complexity. And then for the strike slip case, we saw that if we have a sufficiently thin lithosphere, we actually can form flexural strikes slip facings, assume we have a lot of sediment going on top of it. And finally, uh, we haven't looked much into it, but it seems like surface processes may even become more important in large scale 3D models. Yeah, okay, <laughs> got a little lost there. Okay, that should be it. Wonderful, Derek, thank you very much. Um, I, I didn't say so at the beginning, but um, you can ask uh, questions if you want. You can uh, either unmute, unmute yourself um, or type in a question in the chat. Um, so we've got a, a few minutes for questions here. Um, And while people are thinking about their questions, um, I can maybe uh, start off with one. Um, so you showed, I think it was the strike slip case where you showed um, sediment loading on one side 
um, of the fault, right? And and you uh, indicated that it would, uh, I think it, it would keep the fault longer active. Uh, I was actually wondering, does it change the, uh, I, I'm not a fault person, I'm not a tectonic person, but does it change the magnitude, I guess, of the, um, of the of the of the fault being, I guess, uh, the movement of the fault itself by loading it more on one side, would that accelerate uh, the strike slip movement? Hmm. It's an interesting question. I'm actually not sure. I would think, I think it would depend because a lot of the the strike slip movement. I mean, generally, you're gonna you we'd have something called plastic weakening, so we weaken it, and this would probably determine the maximum movement. So I think at this point, when this is applied, it would already be maximally weakened. But yeah, this is something special if you don't have these like set res says our kind of weakest strength is set in the model and also resolution based. So in the model, it might not make much of a difference, but if we could, you know, theoretically have infinite resolutions or be closer to reality, maybe this could make some change by weakening the material as it's moving as well. Great, thank you. And I see that Mike got his uh, microphone unmuted. Yeah, um, actually looking at the rift breakup models, the influence of sediments, what came to mind was that a number of, of rifts like in South America and uh, the Red Sea, um, there's a huge amount of evaporites that accumulate. And so suddenly you're getting an input of a large amount of sediments uh, very quickly. And I'm wondering your thoughts about how that might change the tectonics or affect the timing of, of breakup. Hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question too. Um, I guess I don't know enough about the difference between like evaporates and sediment when you put it on, but if it, we just assume it's like sediment and we put it on very quick, I think the yeah. main change that it does is that uh, initially, you know, you're, you're putting a lot of cold sediment on top and this actually thickens kind of the brittle layer. So this will keep these faults active and keep the, the rift going longer. Mm -hmm. Okay. But over time, of course, you, when you're putting a lot of sediments, you can also warm it. So it's a bit of can go either way, I guess. Right, well, and, and salt has a, a very high um, thermal conductivity so that it yeah. could would promote the heating up again. Yeah, so maybe this actually would would not be as much of a difference than if it's heating it as well. No. Interesting. But it's an yeah, it's an interesting thing as to how that might because it's it's you know often right around breakup. Thank you, Mike. Um there's another question from Lester in the chat. Um I can uh, briefly read it out. So great talk, Derek. Um, Lester is interested if um, there is some sort of a script uh, available um, where you uh, couple both uh, the, the models, Fastscape and Aspect, and if that's available for the community. That, that's one question. And the other question, more geological question, is about do you think that slow evolving landscapes uh, like uh, Atacama in uh, North Chile uh, could have a strong implication in the structural evolution. Um, okay, so for the first question, it's not quite uh, completely on aspect. So the, the plan is eventually you should download the aspect version and then you'll already have uh, the coupling script ready to go. Right now, you could find it on my GitHub, so it is freely available and we're still working getting it pushed. But um, if there's any questions, you could just email me too and I can help. And for the second question, so uh, could you say it again? Yeah. Um, do you think that slow evolving landscapes uh, like the Atacama in North Chile um, could have a strong implications in the structural evolution? So uh, this is interesting too. I would think Generally, when you change the rate that you're pulling the rift, it doesn't really change the structural evolution that much. They end up pretty similar. But in a case like this, and this is maybe similar with the evaporates too, is if you're doing it much slower and you put the same amount of sediments on, there's going to be more time for it to warm while it's deforming. So I could see maybe surface processes 
wouldn't change this as much, although maybe also you have more time to accumulate sediments. So yeah, it would be interesting. We didn't try this at different velocities, but I would be curious to see. Wonderful, thank you, Derek. Um, and thank you very much for your presentation. Um, if people have more questions about their, uh, Derek's presentation, um, please put them in the chat and maybe Derek, you have uh, time to answer them uh, while uh, Dong Hang Si will present. Um, so we're gonna move on to the next presentation from Dang Han. Dang Han Si will present today on responses of mangrove forest uh, to sea level rise and human interventions using biomorphodynamic models. And the floor is yours, Dang Han. Thanks, Elba. So uh, very interesting talk by Derek. Well, it's a very large scale and very long time scale. So uh, the differences I'm going to present now is kind of like very, <laughs> relatively smaller scale compared to Derek. And it's uh, my PC topic related to coastal mangroves. And we focus on the how mangroves respond to sea level rise and human interventions. So I'm going to start with some very funny figure. And there you go. Yeah, so for someone who never sees the mangroves, these are mangrove seeds that are generated from their mother trees and can be distributed by the wind, flow, and even animals. And as long as these uh, seeds like deposit or stranded on the ground, they will try their best to get their roots longer and strong enough. And therefore they can become seedling and become young mangroves. Of course, some seeds will be flushed away by the strong currents. While it will take some like decades for the young mangroves to become these uh, mature mangroves. Yeah, if you have time, you can release a boat here and start to swim in the, in the mangrove forest. And you wouldn't be surprised for you to say hi to these animals, but definitely not get too close to them. Yeah, that's kind of dangerous. Yeah, so um, I, I was always intrigued by the complex root system when I sail in the mangrove system here. So this root system are also called um, bracing roots or we say uh, pneumatophores, because these roots, they can take up oxygen from the atmosphere and they can filter salt from water. So this extra secret that why they can uh, stay on the seawater for a relatively long time. But one thing I would like to highlight if you look into this profile shape here is there are more sedimentation in the mangrove sites compared to non-sedimentation or a little bit sediment uh, in the adjacent area. So I think it is the, 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 the power of the mangroves which can trap sediment and keep them um, like uh, unflooded by the sea level rise. Yeah. So this is one type of mangrove roots that we just saw. And there are some other type of mangrove roots. So this is like the red one on the left and this is the black one. So we call this Arcinia, and these are even dense roots, but these roots are more like the pencils. So this one is more like the umbrella, this one is more like the pencil sticking out of the ground. And one thing we can tell directly from these two figures is that the roots on the left hand side, it's much more dense. So basically the mango root density can vary with different species, different age and uh, their size. Something we're gonna to talk about this more later on. So mangroves are also under um, pressure nowadays. So they can be easily drowned by sea level rise because you can imagine them when sea level start increasing. So even though mangroves can endure a relative period of inundation, but the sea level goes too crazy, they can still be drowned and even die. And human intervention, for example, they remove mangroves or building the coastal construction somewhere can further uh, constrain mangrove coverage. And we also find now that lost mangroves can further uh, exaggerate coastline retreat. So nowadays, more and more research is focusing on the fate of mangroves using different techniques, like the geological data analysis, metadata analysis, or geoimagery analysis, or field observations, et cetera. And all these research can, narrow, can be narrowed down to one general question. How do mangroves respond to uh, accelerating sea level rise and human interventions? And you know, like you know, numeric model can be an ideal approach to to give you a very um, spatial, temporal, spatial very, uh, predictions in the in the future. Well, when I look into the Google Scholar, I found something interesting. So when I see, okay, mangrove numeric model or salt marsh numeric model, mangrove salt marsh are both very important uh, coastal uh, pools. And I surprisingly find there are much less studies on the mangrove numeric models. 
So this is definitely something that our scientists need to need more emphasis on this stuff. Yeah. So to capture the mangrove response to the changing environment, we need to understand how mangrove interact with their uh, surrounding factors. And this is what we called biomorphodynamic feedback. And this has been widely adopted by the current coastal wetland models. So for the bio part, we need to consider vegetation dynamics, for example, how vegetation colonize, grow, and mortality in the end. For the more dynamic part, it's actually the process that we need to think about how sediment transport together with the uh, water movement and how sediment deposit or be eroded from the ground and the bed level start to update. And of course, that leads to interact right, with how vegetation influence the sediment transport and how the flow influence the vegetation growth. So there's a tiny animation I made to show how my model works. So at the beginning, vegetation colonize on some uh, suitable area and they start to grow and compete with each other and some die and some may keep on growing. So sea levels start to rise and sediment got more time to deposit on the ground and uh, start to bed level increase. However, if the sea level goes too crazy, the mangrove will die eventually because like, they cannot uh, endure very uh, longer uh, invasion. So now we have the model. The first thing I would like to test is how mangrove responds to different sediment concentration and sea level rise. So I'm going to use one second to introduce how we can uh, read uh, this figure. If you look into the right-hand side of figure, it's 1D model, so everything's very simple. Uh, each line represents the, the coastal profile. This is the seaward side and this is the landward side. <clears throat> and you see now there are three different color dots. And each color dot, the location of these color dots represent the location where mangrove colonize. And the right one is a kind of mangroves that prefer a longer inundation period. And this blue one represents white mangroves and that prefer a bit shorter uh, inundation period. While the black one was somewhere in the middle. And I am running the simulation in uh, two constructing simulations. And if we first look into this one, low sediment concentration and high sea level rise rate. So this system looks very stable. You didn't see a lot of profile evolution while all the mangroves kind of shifting landward. So we can say in these systems, in a low sediment concentration and high sea level rise rate, mangroves go hand in hand. It seems like mangroves is dependent on the sea level rise rate. If you look into the insert, which represents the total extent of vegetation. So the extent of vegetation remains stable because there are no change on the profile. Everything moved inland. So not a lot of uh, change is expected. But if you look into the high sediment concentration on the right figure, so there are a lot of sedimentation happens and the coastal profile start to build up and the moving the mangrove seaward. And there's slightly landward retreat for this white mangrove. So, so in general, the total extent of vegetation will be extended. Yeah. However, when we include a dike on the landward part of this coastal area or coastal regions, a lot of difference happens. So if you look into similar, like a low sediment concentration, high sea level rise rate, all mangroves start to retreat landward. While we didn't observe like the blue dot, which represent white mangroves, because like the white mangroves, their landward space has disappeared, been blocked by this uh this dike. So you can kind of see up the re reduction of the coast uh, mangrove extent. Well, if we look into the high sediment concentration and low sea level rise rate, the vegetation start to expand in seaward. Of course, there are no landward retreat, but overall they, they behave like quite similar to the scenario without barriers. If I'm going back forth, now you can compare. So this is the high sediment concentration with barrier, this is without barrier. So actually something similar happening here. <clears throat> yeah. So one thing I would like to highlight, if you look into these regions, that's very interesting that species replacement occurs during the vegetation expansion. And I'm going to quickly expand, explain this within this uh, tiny plot. So during the vegetation expansion, and the sediment transporting to this location is reducing because the sediment is providing extra res uh, resistance. So less and less sediment can be deposited in this area and leading to a, a smaller sediment sedimentation rate in this area. While sea level rise, keeping on increasing, eventually we will increase these locations uh, higher period higher. And for the local species, they cannot endure longer um, higher period and start to die, while there's some new species which can endure a longer species will start to colonize. So this makes a uh, species replacement happen in this location. Yeah. 
So as I mentioned, like the, the root density vary with the different uh, mangrove species, ages, or locations. So I also um, investigate the least impacts of root density in my model results. And now I run two different scenarios, one with sparse roots and one with really dense roots. And something interesting regarding the sediment concentration along this profile. So with sparse roots, you see that more sediment can be transported to the inland area. So the black one is this side here. You can see more sediment can be transported from offshore to its inland area. But if you look into the dense roots, basically most of sediment is, is retained in offshore area. So the different sediment concentration behavior along this profile will eventually shed up different profile shape. So this is like closer transect of this profile. And if you look into the more dense loose scenario, you see the profile is much more um, propagating seaward and less more uh, deposition in the scenario of the, the sparse loose scenario. So what interests me is like the different uh, loop density will shape up different uh, vegetation diversity. So see like this one, you have a very equally disputed vegetation species under the sparse roots, while in the dense root situation, it's kind of like the whole system is gradually dominated by these red mangroves, which means like the diversity is kind of losing. Yeah. In the end, I would like to present this diagram to summarize these findings. So I determine or oh, the, the, the mangrove condition in two different scenarios. One is low in one pressure, one is high in one pressure. In low in one pressure, which is the high sediment supply and low sea level rise. So the high sediment supply and low sea level rise, the mangrove coverage will both increase. But what is this difference is like when you have the dense roots, the vegetation diversity will reduce as we observe like the, it will eventually evolve to a one species dominate systems. While in sparse roots, then uh, a scenario, so all the vegetation diversity, the vegetation diversity will remain stable because we see a relatively uh, stable mangrove species. Well, in terms of the high environment pressure, which is the high sea level rise rate, but the low sediment supply. So if there are no barrier, the system will be controlled by the sea level rise rate because we see all the mangrove species retreat to landward hand in hand, and both the mangrove coverage and diversity will remain, will remain stable. But if there are barrier like build it just after the, the, the main mangroves, you can see like some mangroves can actually disappear and the, the total mangrove extent will reduce. So this is a very simple model and we focus on only one tidal range systems. And next, I'm going to extend my uh, scenario to multiple tidal range systems. So this is a family photo to study the mangrove responses under different tidal range systems and the sediment supply. So from left to right is the increase in tidal range and from the top to bottom is increasing sediment supply. And now I'd like to first on focus on the first row, which means the different sediments, di different tidal ranges, but the same sediment supply. The first thing is that we realize the, the profile remain relatively stable and they are not much like the vegetation expansion or retreat. And uh, we see like a very comparable vegetation extent. And now, if we increase the sediment concentration, you can kind of define that uh, there are more like sediment accretion, a profile accretion build up, and the coastal slope kind of become gentle, and the overall vegetation extent is increasing. Now, if you look into this seawall mangrove age, mangroves tend to colonize a bit higher. If you look, you compare here, mangroves right uh, close to mean water level. As we increase the uh, sediment concentration, mangrove tend to like corners with higher location. And I call this area the distance from the mangrove seawall edge to mean water level as inundation buffer space. So in the in the field, we actually find inundation buffer space is increasing with the different tidal range. And this is very important for mangroves. So when sea levels start to rise, the seawall mangroves will not be inundated immediately because you have inundation buffer space. So now I'm going to include sea level rise here. And there are only two different color dots. So this green dots represent scenario right before sea level rise and the blue dots represent the, the scenario after 100 years of sea level rise. So this is again, like similar family photo, you have increased tidal range from left to right and increase in sediment supply to, from top to bottom. So I would like you to focus on the first column. This is the micro tidal range, a very small tidal range, which go upside and down one meter. And it was surprisingly find all the mangroves start to uh, 
retreat language immediately after uh, sea level start to rise, even under high sediment concentration. So here is the high sediment concentration. It, and if you look into the large tidal range systems, like this scenario, even in a small sediment supply, there are a less language retreat for these mangroves. So if you compare this to this scenario, we can actually draw a conclusion. These mangroves in the micro tidal range system probably will be more vulnerable. And it's interesting to see like there are also stable mangrove seawall edge in this scenario here, even under the intertidal, <coughs> even in the intertidal um, scenario, uh, inter intermediate sediment supply. And I explained this with the um, <clears throat> in a nation buffer space. Like as I said, the well, mangrove colonize at high location, which means you will have like a lower relative hydro period. Rate. Well, when sea level start to rise, water level increase, there are more uh, frequent uh, inundation appears in this uh, in this mangrove site. While this relative hydro period will still remain below the threshold, which means mangrove still like uh, survive. So mangrove will not be inundated will not be inundated immediately within this uh, study period. So a very quick tackle measure of this study. So the people think about the mangrove extent will be increased with tidal range. But from our model, it's actually not true. So the mangrove stand can remain uh, similar among different tidal ranges because we need to consider the coastal slope. And the second thing is that uh, we also observe a stable mangrove seawall edge. And this is something actually people always neglected because we need to think about whether there are uh, inundation buffer space right before mangrove seawall edge. And I think this is very important because the whole world is saying, okay, mangrove is under the high pressure, but is this the real true case? We don't know. Yeah. And the last thing is that the mangroves in the micro tidal system is actually more vulnerable than other systems because we are already see like the sea level rise will emit the inundated mangrove forest and then making the mangrove retreat to landward. Yeah. So something different. Um, as I said, like the whole world think mangrove is so important, they're like calling for to protect mangroves. While in some cases, like the New Zealand, they think mangroves are actually uh, troublemakers because they, they muddy their coastal regions. So what local people start to do is to remove these mangroves with the hope they can restore their sandy beach. But the, the things that they have no clue about the outcome, whether after, after, after they remove mangroves. So we wonder if we can use our model to to tell them the, the results whether or what gonna happen after they remove mangroves. So this is our study site in the in the New Zealand and uh, North S3. And the bottom three and um, S3 you can see the how fast mangrove is expanding seaward and where the location where mangroves are removed. So we built the model. We first run the model um, by adding a model to a uh, with a load matter supply and to mimic the, the pre-disturbance period which means you have a low mass uh, mud uh, going to the systems and a very small main, slow mangrove expansion. And we, in the end, we uh, subsequently, we also add high mass supply to represent the post disturbance, which means you got a great amount of sediment was transported to the systems and together you have a very fast uh, vegetation expansion. And start from this point, we start to divert our scenario to three different directions. So the first, we continue the model run with a continued high mass supply. And, and the other one is that we remove vegetation, just like what they did now. They're trying to remove vegetation to see what's happened. And also the last case, we also run the reduced mass spread from catchment, which means you have reversed the mass spread from high to low and to see what's gonna happen for the systems. So before I step into further about my model results, I would like to think about why local government will think about uh, removing mangroves is a uh, could, could potentially a reliable approach to restore the sandy beach. So we are always informed by this um, local uh, scale knowledge. The presence of mangroves will slow down tidal currents, and tidal currents slow down tidal currents will like um, accelerate mud deposition, and mud deposition will potentially create more space for mangrove to colonize. So this is actually like um, I would say a vicious cycle cycle rule, right? You have the vegetation deposit and more 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 mang more more mangrove more mud more more mangrove, but now. As long as we remove vegetation, it seems at least the binding effects was removed and you have a stronger tidal currents and you are expecting to lower down the mud accretion and therefore you have the uh, muddy regions reduced. So everything sounds very reasonable to me. However, 
when I see my raw results, I was surprised at the model results behavior. So this is the line graphs to show like the muddy regions of the of the of the of the uh, basin in under different uh, model testings. So today we're going to look into these uh, green dots, which represent the mangrove removal scenario. <clears throat> it seems like a mangrove removal, you got to the more muddy regions. And I was confused at first, but now when I look into this plot, everything makes sense. So this is a mangrove channel, and you have the mangrove colonized on these two sides. So the presence of mangroves will limit, will converge the tidal currents within these channels. And all the sediment was moving and together with the tides going upside and down. And sediment is not allowed, of course not, not. Well, the limit sediment can be transported across these tide channel banks. Well, now when we when we remove mangroves, all these binding effects was removed and the sediment is allowed to transport further and you don't have the uh, energy to be conversed in these channels. Seems like the energy was slow and they can have more sedimentation in these channels. So this is like a schematic figure to show my hypothesis. But to demonstrate my hypothesis, I calculate the sediment thickness in different locations of the of the spacing area. So today we're going to look into the layer five different wirings. We look into these three different wirings with the future scenarios that I just modeled. The purple one is that we continue to have high mass supply. And the green one is that we remove the, the mangroves. And the blue one is that we reduce mass, uh, reduce mass supply from the upstream. We first look into the generalized area, which is this, this part. And we see there are more muddy sediment in this area from our model results. And this actually can be explained because all the tidal energy was distributed to other location and the and the tidal energy always hydrodynamic energy is, is kind of smaller in this area, which allow more sediment deposit in this uh, in this channel pit. You will increase your know, mud uh, deposition in these channels. Well if you look into a tidal thread, that this location is kind of closer to channels and this location is further away from channels. So if you look into this uh, further away location further away from channels, you see have that more uh, sedimentation there. So from the purple to the green, you get more sedimentation. So which means our hypothesis is correct. So you have more sediment moving from the channel to the further uh, locations. Well, the only way we can do is to reduce mass supply. If you look into the blue, blue variants, both the channelized area and the tidal phrase, they got a bit lower uh, mass thickness if you reduce the mass supply. So in this case, I would like to advocate uh, my complex model feedbacks <laughs> and make things even complex now. So I call it like Anthro biomorphodynamic feedbacks. So initially, if we look into the local scale feedbacks, vegetation, slow down currents, and uh, encourage sediment deposition. Right, and will will increase will potentially allow more uh, mangroves to colonize. So this actually inspired local people to remove vegetation because they're trying to reduce the uh, modification on their systems. However, we from our model results we show when we remove vegetation, they actually have a uh, more sediment redistribution, which you got a larger estuary in feeling. You potentially will have more intertidal area and creating uh, more area for mangroves to colonize. So what we need to do is that we need to zoom out a little bit further by looking to the upstream. We need to conserve land and we need to reduce or slow down or decline the deforestation upstream and making less sediment being transported through the rivers, through the channels to the coast. And this is what I'm going to do instead of like looking to the coastal area. So this is actually the scale dependent uh, feedbacks for the coastal management. So in summary, we should stop cutting off mangroves in the coast, but we need to manage the, the upstream land activity. Yeah. So all the uh, code that I talked about today can be found in my like, pages. If you scan the, this code here, you can easily get very uh, the code and how they like, coupled and um, a detailed instruction how you can start the model. Yeah, I think this is all my presentation. I hope I didn't exceed, exceed the time too much, but uh, I'm happy to have here if you have any questions. Thank you very much for your talk and you know, for, for your presentation, Daman. Yeah, thanks, Albert. Um, we're a little bit over the hour, but um, if, if people can uh, stick around, it will be great. Um, 
now is the time to ask uh, questions to Dang Han. And I see Mike uh, unmuted, so go ahead, Mike. Yeah, I'm just mulling over trying to take in all the things. And just uh, the first thing I was like, because I work a lot in, in Bangladesh, and one of the things where they're doing or thinking about anthropogenic changes of increasing the um, embankments is they're also thinking about mangrove forestation around it. And the question, one, so one question is whether or not that will work in the face of rising, rising sea level um, if you plant uh, a thin strip of, of mangroves in front of an embankment, um, will they will they survive and help grow the land or or not? Yeah, it's it's a so the question is like the in the in the background we uh, we have a sea level rise. The planting mangroves, how it will less survive or better will less survive, right? Yeah, so I think it's a very it depends on locations. We see so many mango restoration projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the kind of kind of story like when you plant the long mangroves in the in a location, you probably will kill that mangroves because, like you know, as I see, as I show, like mangrove species, like red, black, and blue. If you remember just right. now, so different mangroves they have different like preference on the inundation period, sure. right? Yeah. So for for example, if you plant like mangroves yeah. only into a short period, they definitely will kill mangroves. And also like the different their colonization strategies. Some mangrove will colonize very quickly and can help them to stabilize themselves very quickly and then eventually evolve to the seedling and um, and young mangroves. While some mangrove can be easily be flushed away by the strong tidal currents or we say mm -hmm. waves. So it's a lot of uncertainty going around. So it depends on the size. But I would say, yeah. We have we have seen a lot of failures happening in the mangrove restoration sites, so you're gonna have to be careful about it. Yeah, you know? you gotta choose which mangroves very carefully. Yeah, and also dependent on the local condition. Yeah, right. Yeah. Are there any other questions? If not, I have one uh, question then now. Um, okay, so your model uh, kind of takes into account um, slow, I, I call it a slow hazard, so sea level rise, right? It, it's slowly propagating, it's slowly getting, you know, your, your sea level getting increased, uh, potentially affecting your, uh, your mangrove forest or mangrove trees. Um, what about... Uh, you know, short duration, high impact, like uh, cyclones would. So in, in real world, mangroves are mostly positioned around, uh, well, around a, a large band around the uh, equator. And, but that's also where um, cyclones uh, take place, right? So would a cyclone uh, damage mangrove forest uh, such that it would kill them or would it actually strengthen the the mangrove trees or forest by by affecting them but then then give them a new boost to recover uh, yeah would, would that, yeah would so I, I'm wondering if that would how that would impact actually your your, yeah, your we, simulations we, yeah I agree so um the cyclone impact cyclone on the mangrove forest it's actually like happen a lot if especially like what you say the, the in the tropical subtropical area it's a very uh we say cyclone activity uh, regions and they will also like kill mangroves at some point because like you you have very strong waves uh flow currents like can be easily flushed away or directly break the mangroves yeah so but it, i mean like this is a very short-term impact the study i'm showing is like the long-term impact how mangrove can gradually adapt to sea level rise of course like in the short impact you have suddenly mangrove be flush away let's like say in the case during cyclones mm -hmm. but at some point mangrove will if the condition is allowed the mangrove will start to recolonize and and of course like dependent on the we say the windows like if you allow mangrove to grow to the similar state to the similar material state, or you have another cyclone to coming up again to remove uh, everything away, right? So um, a, a very 
a similar example in the Australia, in the North Australia, they got El Nino event. They suddenly had got like um, tons of mangrove was dying. It's, I think the whole coastal mangrove was 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 oh. was died during a very large drought event instead of a cyclone. <laughs> but the people think about maybe mangrove will recolonize in this in this in this location. And I, I have a master's student working on this. And we actually find it's not that easy because like the, the frequently cyclone occurs in lead regions would kind of like um I would say stop mangrove to recolonize because as soon as you have a tiny baby mangrove colonized layer, the cyclone comes will destroy this mangrove skin. So it make it a bit it's a bit hard for mangrove to recolonize. But of course, it's again it depends on the locations. In some locations, for example, you you the mangrove was died. And the cyclone is not like frequent. It's uh, it's possible for mango to regrow and become the mature again. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Um, if there are no other questions, then I think we can uh, close this uh, this webinar session. Um, I wanna.